Hey everybody, what's up? It's MJ. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is CMS Certified Sommelier and Wine and Spirits Educator, Bruno de Almeida. Uh, Bruno was born and raised in Lipson, Portugal. He landed in New York City in 2002 and has been working in the hospitality scene ever since. A rock and roll drummer for most of his life, Bruno kickstarted his career in the restaurant industry as being a musician wasn't always paying the bills. Having worked at legendary restaurants like Gusto Restaurant, Pau, Inotica, Corsina, Balbusta, Locanda Verde, and Dirty French, Bruno started taking his Somme journey more seriously in 2008. Until the pandemic hit, he was the wine director and sommelier at the iconic Tocqueville. Might have fucked it up, but that's okay. And given his Lisbon roots, it's no surprise that he is a passionate advocate for Portuguese wine. I'm super excited because I know very little. Like I said in my thing, I know shit. I know port, a little Madeira. So I'm real excited. Welcome, Bruno. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So Bruno and I connected through Instagram, which just works for me for somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been following you. Uh, your handle's uh, Dramalier. Uh, so... Tell us about these wines we're going to be drinking today. So today I brought to you, like, um, uh, again, like Portuguese wines, like they tend, they are really expressing right now, like the, the diversity that they can bring. And they totally, like, express the people, they express the land. So been making, it's a country been making wine for a long, long time. But uh, basically, like, let's say, like, around the 80s, that's when, like, you see wines from Portugal, Spain, and even Greece that started, like, to come up because... They got in, in the European community, so investment. And um, and then moving on, like then in the late 90s and early 2000s, there's been a generation of uh, winemakers bringing uh, different techniques, fresher wines, um, exposing like different, or actually going back to the roots of their, like their ancestors used to make wine. So I brought you a sparkling, like huge tradition in Portugal. Huge, huge. So this comes from Bairrada. Uh, which is basically in the center of the country. It's like basically like two hours up from Lisbon, one hour south of Porto. And uh, the winemaker is great. Like you work at Chipurão, a big, a big uh, producer in Portugal, in Alentejo. But uh, his roots are uh, to Bairrada, to this region in his family. So I'm bringing you a sparkling, which is something very traditional in the region. Uh, from red sparklings, not sparkling Syrah, something like that. Okay. Or, Brusco, <laughs> or, or like, no, like beautiful red sparklings, mm -hmm. mostly made from the the, the grape varietal called Baga, means like tiny berry. Mm -hmm. And Bajada means barro, means clay. So there's a lot of clay in here. Uh, very close to the Atlantic. Um, I was going to say, um, seafood is that same, it was screaming, so screaming out for seafood. Exactly. Like you, so you're going to see like a little saline nuances. Mm -hmm. Baga plays a, a little bit of a role in here, but you have Bical, which is a fresh, peachy, a bright acidity varietal. And then Circial, not to be confused with the Circial in Madeira. Mm -hmm. It's a different Circial spelled uh, with a C. Uh, which is called the Dog Strangler in the Dodo Valley. It's called Shigenekel <laughs> because it's so difficult. But Bug is very difficult, too, as a red varietal. It's like very, uh, has a temper. It's like, for me, it's like the Pinot Noir in combat boots instead of like playing <laughs> high heels. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's fairly Pinot Noirish, the, 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 the grape varietal Baga, mm -hmm. but uh, very Nebbiolish, too. So if you like that kind of wines, even uh, Xenomavros coming from... Um, from Greece, like, um, has great tension, uh, very exquisite. Um, it's beautiful to play around, but in this region, so that's quite of a French influence. And of course, like Burgundian um, Cistician monks that went to Portugal brought that kind of culture. Like, so I'm bringing you wines like that totally resemble the people because Portugal like colonized whatever they wanted to do, like in the 1500s, like going all over the place. But in the meantime, it's a land that everyone came across, Phoenicians, Greeks, right. uh, Northern uh, Muslim. Everyone was over there, and everyone put like something in the country. And the wines totally scream mainly right now. They really scream that. And so, like, of course, we're having a little bit of a, that Frenchy uh, approach in this, uh, in the, in this wine, uh, traditional method. So, but brought you something totally different. This is spans like as you can see from the color mm -hmm. and uh, like the oxidative nuances like goes through a solera style. Oh wow! Okay. So they use like around an average of uh, nine year old uh, nine year old um, wines, and they just try to do something a little different, very minimal intervention, very minimal sugar, and I think it's just great. Luis Patron does a great job in this, and he's one of the faces of the new wine making in Portugal. Yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. Fuck. 
the show started off so dope. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, like this screams seafood because, like, when you're going off the coast to this place, like, you just like feel the breeze going mm-hmm. on. Like at night during mm-hmm. the day, I spent some time li- with my mom. She was living fairly close by. Then I was coming from the coast inland, and you just can feel like the breeze, like in the, in this wine. So little selling quality, but uh, that kind of pastry notes, like a beautiful, like slight touch of brioche, but candied fruit. But uh, that you can do like a pork chop, you can do like caramelized apples, something like a grilled seafood. Like you can do a lot of things, and not only um, just do like the celebration thing. So sure. like most of these people, like in this region, very small region, like with a lot of kind of crews, like you find like in Burgundy, everything like it's so totally different. Instead of having beer, like most of Portuguese do, like in their fridge, they have a bottle of sparkling. So that's a great tradition that they have within them. They drink a lot of sparkling in this region. Wow, that's cool, man. That's yeah. what's up. Awesome. All right, so, wow. Tell me about growing up in Lisbon. Oof. Damn, man. <laughs> um, as, I, as I, He's like, tell me about growing up in Fort Greene in the <laughs> 80s. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, Lis- yeah. I mean, because it is a city. Mm-hmm. And, like, I don't, you know, you know, this is, this is the second time we've had two black wine guys on the show. It's really mm-hmm. cool. Except this is the Portuguese black <laughs> wine guy. It's even doper. He's got the dope accent. He's got better dreads. Um, <laughs> he's a musician. Um but yeah, like you know, I all all I know is I've traveled around yeah. America a lot, mm-hmm. and wherever there's people of color and it's a city, it it can be rough. Mm-hmm. So what was it like growing up in Lisbon? Uh, I had a lot of challenges. Like I grew up so in '76. Yeah, I'm going to be 45, dude. And um, in during that time was fairly dramatic because the country just got off from a dictatorship. Mm. Uh, not as aggressive like the the Franco dictatorship in Spain, but we or the one we just got rid of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! So exactly, <laughs> no, no, but but exactly like that. Like I had a few kind of uh, not necessarily arguments, but with people when I hear like because we don't want a country to go socialist because I come from Cuba and blah blah blah. Like let me tell you something. I grew up in the in the seventies, mm-hmm. and the country was getting rid of a dictatorship, like really far right dictatorship. And my mom, like, would tell me, like, when we were growing up, like, I couldn't go to that place because my mom, she was from Manzabik, she was black, mm-hmm. big Afro, coming from the 60s, like, revolution students and stuff like that, listening to James Jop- uh, the, the Janis Joplin and uh, Barbara Streisand and my father listening to Emerson, like, in Pomlin and everything. Like, so black people, like, doing that in Portugal, like, was a little, like, what are you listening to? Like, the, you, know, <laughs> you should be listening this and this and that, like, because you come from the colonies, you should listen to our music, like, and they weren't. Right. So... There was quite of, uh, even my name should be Alexander, but he couldn't because it was too much of a communist name. Mm. So my name is Bruno Alexandre. Mm. That was accepted. Mm-hmm. But Alexander, my, not my son's name, <laughs> was the first thing that I decided, like, you're going to be named as Alexander. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> so, like, stuff, just minimal stuff like that. But um, growing, like, during that time, like, as a, as a black person of black parents was a little difficult. It was not that easy going to school and everything like you know like was was not the easiest thing no yeah yeah so um i we know you're really into music did that start when you were young and as a kid when did you start totally like listening to my father like with uh the big vinyl the r- arena rock stuff like from kiss and he was listening to uh kiss live and peter chris is doing this uh drum solo which he, he was trying to resemble a, a, a train Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, man, this is dope. <laughs> so I started like that totally caught my eye. My parents were musicians, too. Like like my mom left to dance, like all very African. But again, listening to all that kind of stuff. So that grew up on me when I was like six, eight and then 10. I was already like getting sticks and drumming on on pens and pillows and everything. And then I finally got a drum set like when I was 12 or something. So that's what really kicked me. And um, listening to records, like I totally, I still have some of my parents' records and everything. So that really played a role because that was that um, was their way of expression, uh, expressing themselves during those times was through music. You know, getting like late at night again in the 80s. I remember like my first record was actually Duran Duran. Oh, uh, uh, the, the Rio one? No, not the Rio. Hungry like the wolf. Hungry like the wolf. No, no, no. The 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 seventh and the rage tiger. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'm, yeah. So I'm, I'm I'm a little bit older than you. The so, yeah. reflex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I was totally like dancing, like one o'clock in the morning, having to go to school the next day because my parents had to go 
to their like niche, to their friends, like to the, these kind of spots that even in the early 80s, they could not go to certain places. Because they were um, because like a, the, a mixed couple. Because, no, 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 they no. were not mixed. Like my father was actually, he's from, he, he was from Northern Africa, okay. but he's like very like, uh, um, fairly white. He's from Saint Domingue, Prince, and my mom, she's very black. She was very black. Right. She was actually from Mozambique with a big backbone from the Zulu, mm -hmm. from the Zulu uh, tribe in, in South Africa. Right. Like back, like he, her great grandmother was. So like that's the, the the mix came from. But we would, she would go out with her friends, and I would be like sleepy, but dancing to the to uh, to the render, and and she finally got me a record. But they would be doing this late at night because you had to be in some place secluded. Because till that, to till that time, actually in the early '80s, would be kind of a, a Gestapo, like looking up for like small groups that could be um, doing something underground towards the colonies. Yeah, sub subversive they call it, right? Yeah. yeah. And actually, yeah. I think my father got in trouble for that. So. Damn, man. I mean, it's it's so it's crazy. Yeah, guerrilla, I mean, it's he was crazy. he was really like on like in guerrilla guerrilla radio, like basement stuff, like again coup d'état, like back in the, their countries. So like, um, I saw all that. Yeah, I mean, so like people, it's it's funny um, when you say about Portugal because it seems like such a small country, but it's like it's on a peninsula, so a great great navy and ships and yeah, and and and. Portugal ran slaves longer than anybody. They were all over the world. They just kept going for like another 80 years. <laughs> they just kept running them. Um, and so it's it's very interesting um, to, 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 to learn about this. From You know, I, I went to the museum down in Washington, D.C., and they, they showed every country and how long they were running slaves. And Portugal was like 15-something. <laughs> they were like the longest, like, you know. You know, like mainly like – Mainly, like with whatever is going on in the world, like, and that just like brings up to your mind this all these kind of small details. Like, I w remember, like, when one of the things I love about wine is like maps and geography and mm -hmm. all that kind of crap. Mm -hmm. I love that, like, it really fuels me. I love it since I was a kid by collecting like all these cards and stickers from soccer and everything. But then the country would tell you like the currency, like the flag, where it's located, and everything. So, that actually like started a path for me, like, in terms of like wine maps and like all that geekery mm -hmm. and I remember being with my mom and she would be telling me like you do understand that the African continent it's bigger than what are you looking at right now yeah the, people don't get the map is not to fucking scale no so that's it's like crazy to this day <laughs> yeah the scales were always off and then like later on like when my mom started like coming visiting me when I had my son she would like look at me like because I have all these maps like in my office or in, like and like she would like Remember, like, when you used to talk about this, like, and, like, look at those maps. Do you think they're really factual? Like, <laughs> uh, no, mom. <laughs> we spoke about this. Like, you're so true. Um, but uh, that um, that started, like, really, like, that that thing, like, with, uh, with, with, with Portugal and that perspective of, like, mainly when you have parents who are very active mm -hmm. during the 60s and, and trying to, uh, let's just talk about my last name. You really think my last name is Almeida? Right. No, my l other last name, it's not Silva. Silva can be related like to uh, to uh, to Jewish because mm -hmm. it's the name of a tree, and that's all the names of trees. Like in um, mm. in Europe, they had to um, give up their names and they put um, they gave themselves names of trees in order like not to be recognized by the Inquisition. So apple tree, pear tree, like chestnut tree. Either you live, go to uh, Uruguay, Argentina, Venezuela, and then to the U.S. and Brazil, or you actually change your name or you just convert to the Spanish Inquisition. So my mom always told me, like, there's no way that that's my name. Right. That's a Portuguese given name. Like, right. we had our names. Like, right. So that comes like that kind of systemic racism that we, we can always, like, bring up and talk about it, like, can go to just to your simple last name, you know, like something like that. Yeah, no, I have a, um, my, my <coughs> buddy of mine. He was my roommate in law school, and, and his father's from Lebanon. He's Lebanese. And um, he, when he moved over here, he changed his name from Farrar to George. So a lot of people mm -hmm. would, would, would take George for George Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, they would adopt these the most American name they could to, to not stand out, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, 
so much that people get to take for granted. You know, like, you know, my name, last name's Taller. That's all British, just British exactly. and, and, and Welsh, mm-hmm. right? That's, that, that's <laughs> like, that's, you know, that, that's <laughs> what, they, like, you look it up, that, like, it, that's where it goes, right? And I'm, you know, you know, so it's just really, you know, interesting. And, and I like what you said about how, because of the way you were raised and, and your heritage and, and, and the kind of what your parents and still you like the, the love of maps and kind of like how it's, it, it really did kind of mold, uh, like, the educator uh part of uh you and wine but I, I i before we move on like what what's going on with your music right now you... Oof, i know dude like again like it doesn't pay bills and everything but you know uh, that comes like with a part of my journey like in life in general but mainly like in wine in here like um i always had like to prove myself extra work extra hours um to get that recognition, anything to get, you know, like, so I'll, once I started like being really focused in hospitality, I started like to spend more hours in hospitality. Okay. And I decided myself to be like, okay, like if I'm spending all these hours, I need to spend time with my kid in the morning. So in a job interview, anything I would be saying like, uh, I don't work mornings because I need to pick up my son at three. I'll be here at four because otherwise I won't see him. So. I need to be there like hey unfortunately i didn't have that father figure like when i was a kid so i i decided not i decided that i had to be that person pick him up you know like that's why i have my tattoo like i have his uh handprint on my uh on my um uh side of your neck there on my neck because that's the way he would fall asleep when oh, i was oh. so like i decided like i need to do that <laughs> because so but i lost a lot of opportunities i lost a lot of things because like scheduling like being being trying to be a parent as much as you can so with all that like the music part started like to uh you know like you don't want to just like play like in your days off and then you're not spending time with your family and your kid and everything and um so i kind of stopped it a little bit over there but one of the great things that always learned about being in the u.s is the fact that you can be 25 you can be 45 and that's always going to be a chance for you, like to continue to do your passion and follow your 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 dreams and listen to Jimi Hendrix and you know like that was one of the things that really like my mom told me like uh, listen remember when you listen to Jimi Hendrix like now you're right there like you know, like you watching the trains and all that thing like you know like that's all that she always like she would come over here like Bruno like let like, can we go to gospel can we go to Harlem can we go to like to Brooklyn like and she would be like remember when you listen like all these records and stuff like that like yeah so like so i had to pick my battles a little bit but i think now that time has changed in the past 12 months yeah i'm really i have like three drum sets so something needs to happen (laughs) um and now with technology like i'm connecting more with my peeps like back in portugal they're like hey would you like to do like um uh some some drums in this thing like you like like to do a song and like so you never know so so tell me about so you, you you're in new york you get here in 2002 um you're ready to rip it up on the drum scene rock scene and then um w- um <clears throat> what was like your first restaurant gig well, let's not forget that i was meant to come here in 2001 but oh. we all know what happened oh. in 2001 shit so we were meant as a band to come in 2001 but then unfortunate things happened in 2001 and the uh, record industry like was really hit was already being hit with Napster and whatever. Oh yeah, man, that's fair. just the worst. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I, I did use Napster and I felt bad about it. Of course, it, but come on, because you're you know you're like like free music. But but <laughs> but like you get old, you're like ah, that's fucked, bro. <laughs> Stealing people's shit. I can pay for it. Got to be like Tupac. You ever see? I saw this thing with Tupac where he was in New York City, and people were bootlegging his tape, and he went up to his tape. And was like, "Dude, that's my shit, right?" He's like, "Dude, stop selling my shit." The guy's like, "What? What? What? What?" You know? And, and Tupac's like, "Look, I will bust your ass. <laughs> you saw my fake." Tea. Listen, like I have. So before even after, there was all that. There was bootlegging. There was, there was a lot of, like, and I learned that because that's something you didn't see, like in, in Europe and in Portugal. But my first apartment was in Clinton. Like Clinton, Washington, the the the, the train stop, mm-hmm. the C stop in uh, in Brooklyn, and I was like, I need to do a Led Zeppelin tattoo. I need to, I need to. So I did, I did um, 
Physical Graffiti. This is actually not of my favorite uh, records, but the the front of the building was so similar, which actually the front is actually in um, St. Mark's Place. And I decided to do it, like, Bruno, now you need to do that. Like, um, and, I, and I tattooed that because I just felt like everything just made sense. And you would go down the street and you see like all like these like CDs, like of, you know, like Nas, like, like 2002, mm, right. yeah, like, yeah. you know, like, you know, like, oh man, I always wanted to hear like Hillmatic and all that kind of stuff, like, and all these records. And again, I'm a rock metal dude, but like being in New York, like coming, like you just, just feel it. Like, you know, my landlord like was like, listen to this, listen to that. <laughs> like, like he was like, Bruno need to listen to 50 Cent. Like, this is dope, this is dope. <laughs> but I was, I was just feeling it and I, my my second approach in, in in hip hop came like when like when I was here in two thousand and when I landed in two thousand and two, and of course all the things that happened, great things that happened you know, in the two thousand in the nineties with uh, with hip hop, you know like the huge <laughs> clan and all that thing. Like oh, even yeah. for me as a metal dude, I think like big being metal and rock. I think like I love classic music, and the same thing with hip hop. There's a lot of similarities. Yeah, I was gonna say like I mean because like. In the eighties, it w- it was that was the whole thing was be free. Ru- yeah, but Russell Simmons was smart. Like he he was like, I gotta get this rock, I gotta get these rock kids, I get these white kids listen to right. So he mm-hmm. walked this way, and then ever I mean, there's been a number. I mean, Public Enemy, man. Public Enemy, like literally that was my thing. Like we like we had AM radio. You know, I'm 52. We had AM radio, so I <laughs> I grew up on fucking AM radio. The Carpenters, all that shit. I know all that. All that white shit, right? I know all that shit, right? <laughs> but then you be like, damn, did they just fucking sample when when Tribe Calls like, did they just sample Lou Reed? Like, like it was just like, <laughs> yeah, you know. But it, I think there's there, there's always been this thing where the, the music has always come together. I mean, the Rolling Stones stole all that shit was the blues, you know, was old blues song. So it's always been in music this this it's all rock and fucking roll. Mm-hmm. In all honesty, it's all rock and roll, mm-hmm. you know. But then like. Oh man, so it's, it's just, we need like three hours. I mean, like, because I can digress. I mean, Living Color in the '80s, yep. you know, fuck, right? Like, mm-hmm. um, bad. The, the best punk bands were Black Bad Brains. Bad Brains, yeah, yeah. I mean, and 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 Henry Rollins has said that, like, exactly. we want to be Bad Brains. Bad Brains. I mean, Fishbone, mm-hmm. yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers were like, we mm-hmm. fucking Fishbone. They were the shit. Exactly. We were trying to be like Fishbone. You know, exactly, and, and and that's one thing about music is like, who could we get white to do what the black <laughs> kids are doing? <laughs> you know, uh, no, but even like like for instance, again, like my thing with Led Zeppelin, like and how they their experience like to be like traveling and touring in the U.S., like how they got to their like folk, yeah. you know, like you know, like that kind of grass root kind of thing, like they totally changed like their approach and how they incorporated all those all those elements that really like really struck me like that. You know, like the feel of like when plant like would sing, like I would totally connect and how um, you learn with diversity. Yeah. So one hundred percent, one hundred percent. So you get over in two thousand two after the, all that nine eleven stuff, which we will never forget. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, did you, how'd you like? What, what was your first restaurant job? Like, I was it dishwasher? Or d- yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's something like for me, like. As much as I, I don't, I don't necessarily like would say that uh, I think that like for uh, new sums that want to start, that want to start in this industry, mainly right now, that is quite of, um, that is quite of um, a transition for a lot of sums and the industry is trying to revamp themselves. I think that's a great opportunity for the whole hospitality to think about what they need to do, how they need to improve if you want to you know, revamp yourself, reinvent yourself as a psalm, or you want to start as a psalm, it's like, go back to the basics. And one of the things that I'm truly proud of is washing dishes, because now I can understand, like, why my dishwasher, my porter, like, they, they cannot leave at 12 o'clock in the morning during a pandemic when they touch all this dishware and silverware, because I know what they went through, because I did it. Yeah. So, like, the way that I progressed through my uh, my hospitality life, like, is to understand every position you know, like I did everything. I love to bartend. Like my relationship with my customers and try to understand like why they always drink a Manhattan, but today they just need a filthy dirty martini. Right, right. You know, right, like right, yeah. that breaks down into wine. Like yeah. and then like it's all about like you need to read people and 
I don't know if that's because I'm a Taurus or something like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that might help a little bit. But but yeah, so I, I started like washing dishes and mopping the floors like for a few months when I when I realized like Bruno, like you your savings are done as a musician, like this is gonna take a while. The the whole industry was taking a while because of two thousand and one. So I did that and then like starting like being a busboy runner and then a few couple of years I was being a server and bartending and that's how I did. All right, so listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a pause you right there. We're gonna dive into that a little bit deeper. We need to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um so I, I like I love what you said because you're not the first guest to say that, right? Because we live in this digital Instagram y area influencer era and there's people who um you know are getting their 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 certificates and um but don't never worked in hospitality exactly you know and i mean robert Bohr is like i was, I was a dishwasher you know uh mm-hmm. dustin wilson he's like when he went to work with frasca wine group you know bobby bobby said you're gonna fucking clean the bathroom right yeah. like you know like and i love what you said about how that made you appreciate it like exactly. you you understand the whole progression you know and then also some i love what you said um because another guest said it, and I, I'm so fortunate, my guests, I get the dopest guests, <laughs> um, about how you have to read the room, like know, know what's going on that day, right? Like like literally, like you said, like oh, they always drink a Manhattan, but you know, I, I want a, the dirtiest fucking martini, and like, and then they'll, they'll open up to you, and they'll tell you about their day, and like, it's like, fuck that, just give me some vodka, a little olive juice. <laughs> <laughs> on the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so <clears throat> you worked your way up, and then... Um, where were you when you first? So, uh, what, what, what? When did you catch like the wine bug out of this though? So, f- great question. Like, um, so I grew up actually. So I grew up in Lisbon. Lisbon is actually one country. So when you lay landing down in Lisbon, like before, like a lot of times you will be like circling and circling because the airport is in the middle of the city, which is crazy. Um, but you see vineyards on the, on the left, you see vineyards on the right. It's just vineyards all over the place. Wow. So where I grew up, I grew up in a, a close to a, I grew up my, my second part when I was 10. My mom decided like, uh, she was a painter too. Like I need to go to the camp, to the countryside. I, that's when my parents like divorced and mm-hmm. everything. I need a break. So we went to the countryside close to a uh, wine country, which is a sub region in Lisbon called Bucellas. And I always had that like that feeling like this is awesome. Like, you know, like you're going through the vineyards like once in a while. Like and for me it was a city, but I would, was not taking it seriously. But once I land down I land in um in uh, in New York and start working, like, oh crap, how can I I was working in Portuguese restaurants in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like iconic um iconic pound in um right neck close to uh, to the year end. Probably have been in the year end. Every one of us have been in the year end. <laughs> um and for me to try to explain what a Tarragon is, you know, is like what? Right. It's not even Port or Lancers Rosé or, <laughs> or Matus. Like, how can you spell Matus? Like, it's Matus. But, uh, but it's, it's all good. <laughs> I but remember those ads, man, for <laughs> Lancers and Matus. <laughs> but uh, listen, I'm totally thankful for all those brands because they opened up wines that we're drinking today. Otherwise, it's like thinking about, like, um, you know, White Zinfandel. It's well, the same thing. Well, I tell people, White Zinfandel saved the California wine industry. They weren't selling fucking wine. Exactly. So uh, th- th- you had to so reach new is. people, you know? So, I mean, uh, you know, uh, once you get into wine, you, you, you like a lot of shit you poo-poo or you just drank to get fucked up when you were younger. <laughs> you, you actually have an appreciation because, um, you know, they sustained an industry. They to opened a the path. Yeah. You know? you know, like they opened the path and we have to be thankful. It's just, again, it's all about diversity and they opened the path to diversity and, and I'm thankful for all those, you know, like minds and and thinkers and everything so i had to come up with a you know like trying to uh how can i res- like uh showcase like a a, a dodo blend steel wine mm-hmm. to someone that likes bordeaux so i started like to uh, to study so that approach of living close to the wine country it's not i was not really taking seriously wine i wasn't as i was a kid and my mom was actually dealing with uh, alcohol problems so i was not really trying to move towards that area, sure. that those neighborhoods, because, again. Um, so when I came to the U.S., it was totally different. And I had to, like, start learning about wine, like reading all the craziest books, like from, you know, like uh, 
what's the name of like for the idiot stuff? Like, oh, that was my, that's my book, <laughs> Wine for Dummies. <laughs> wine for Mary dummies. Ewing Mulligan. That's like that's no, like one of the best wine books. I mean, like it's comprehensive enough that it gives you a good footing, and you I, go from there. I remember it was like two thousand and three, and I went to. What's it? What's the name? Barnes and Nobles still exists. Yeah, yeah, Barnes and Nobles. Still and you would just fucking you, you you wouldn't even buy the book. You just go there on a Saturday and sit for two fucking hours and read the book. Take no. and if you're a gangster, which I don't take <laughs> notes, but you probably were taking notes and shit. But like, you I know. was, <laughs> I was because like I had to learn. Like I knew my Portuguese wines fairly well for that time being, and and of course uh, Spanish wines. But people ask me like, oh, I love Chianti, I love Sangiovese. I was like, what? I'm gonna do this. Like so. I had to um, to kickstart like my my like starting to read books and everything like there was no Google, you know like there was nothing like that. So for everyone, it's out there like trying to learn like now guys you have Google, you have your phone on your pocket, like you have the answer like in two minutes. Like I will be right back to you about the book. I know, right? You know, right, like, right that's right. something that we cannot do. But you know what? People are lazy. Like literally, I'll post something on Instagram, <laughs> and someone will say, "What's the wine?" I'll answer it, and people are like, "What's the wine?" I'm like, motherfucker, read the comments. It's, exactly. it's, it's acid, just, acid. Like, literally, it cannot be more easier. Exactly. Oh, man, tell <laughs> me about it. It's already right there. Tell me about it. Like, you know, like, uh, once this thing with the pandemic started, I, I was like, okay, Bruno, like, we, I need to continue to do my thing. I have tons of wine. What can I do? You know, like, you work with great people. Like, so what can I do, like, to make um, the situation better for everyone? And, of course, my peeps back in Portugal, of course. We're talking about, for instance, two wines that are not necessarily in retail. This is like very small production of wines that you can only. These are great, by the way, man. I'm I'm on the still wine, <laughs> and oh my god, it's like, ah, oh, it, it they're so good. So I decided like to kickstart that whole thing by um, start talking about wines like this and to approach like people in like through um, through my um, through my thing, you know, on ins on Instagram, and the way that I every everything can be approachable, but. You know, I'm talking about a wine. I'm telling you all these things. For some people, can be geeky and, and everything, but first and foremost, like English is not my mother tongue. And secondly, like I'm Good exposed. For you. It's not really <laughs> mine either. <laughs> I struggle with it every day. Of but my my, life. my um, then the second part, it's like you opening yourself to critique. Right. But so like, right. and people like, oh, but how the one tastes like? How can I pair? Like, it's in the comment. You know, I'm talking about. And that is so you know, true, bro. It's a pork chop. I'm like, if you want, I can go deep on that pork chop. <laughs> 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 but I love pork. I love all that fat. Like, it's all my cholesterol. But, but, um, but yeah. But uh, it, it is totally true. Like, I think a lot of times, like, yes, we sums like, and I've been learning about that. Like, not trying to be like so geeky about it but that's our drive right but yes like a lot of times i think we should have like a more um comprehensive a more clear more broad like kind of message and i try to do my best but um what was what were we doing? we're just talking man i told you <laughs> i told you we were just going to have a conversation it's flowing through it but actually it's funny um you did you mentioned like you also said that you love italian wine and yeah so wine. i went to italian wine because of that because of the portuguese wines so I had to start to understand, like, Italian wines, it's actually my base. For a lot of Assoms, like, French wines, are, it's the base. But actually, I started with Italian wines. And the reason is, like, Portugal and Italy, like, they're fairly similar because they all came across with different um, invaders and with different people, came across different uh, uh, migration periods, kingdoms, and everything. And that's a lot to explain in the wines. And mainly, like, in the white that we're going to drink now, explains a lot. So actually, we're drinking... Uh, a wine from the Azores Island, so it's in the middle of the ocean, um, and it's so the Azores is a great archipelago, which has, actually is not very close to Portugal, like the same way with Madeira. Madeira is actually it's like Sicily; it's closer to Africa than the country. <laughs> 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 Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> but the Azores is right in the middle; it's like in the same latitude of um, of New York. Um, so it's an island that a lot of people came across with. Right. So, again, like, talking about, like, wines that sort of resemble, like, the culture of the country, mm -hmm. of course, islands. You know, like, talk about Sicily, Canary Islands, Tenerife, like, Corsica, of course, like, all the Greek islands and everything. Everyone left something. Yeah. You know, like, from yep. the people to the grapes. Right, right. And in this wine, actually, um, what happened in the, in the Azores was very interesting that the... Um, the tracking of the varietals. We have two varietals in this wine. Okay. It's Arinto dos Açores, which is different from the Arinto Continental Arinto that I grew up with in Bucelas, what I told I'm you. I'm not going to try and say that. 
even even if it was even if it was anglicized, I would fuck it up. And, but you got that smooth ass accent. I'm like, okay. So uh, this will be in the show notes, everybody. <laughs> this is a blend of Arinto dos Açores, again different from the Arinto in, in continental Portugal, and Verdelho. So basically the same grape that you would find like in Madeira. But okay. again, Verdejo, like easily people can go like to Verdejo. It's not Verdejo in Spain. Um, even in Portugal, continental Portugal is kind of a little bit of a misunderstanding. It's actually called Gouveia, um in the Godelho in Spain. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like Godelho. And um, yeah, But yeah. they're kind of fairly kind of siblings, but different. Um, As but siblings this, are. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know if you, yeah, I got a sister. But for instance, same. like talking about like the Verdejo, like where the Arintos are sort of the other grape, it's actually Verdelho can be like the mother for this grape, but then the grape can be traced like all over, like all these islands in Europe, like can go can be traced like from from Greece to the Canary Islands and everything, but again not to be uh, misunderstood with Verdicchio, with Verdelho and yeah, like, r- which but, are very clearly, but but, but uh, it's a volcanic so volcanic formation, but actually fairly young. When you compare, like to Madeira, compared mainly to Sicily and Canary Islands, it's a fairly uh, uh, young formation of uh, basaltic rock, which, like, it's it's amazing what, what what happens in here that the vines are actually trying to dig through the cracks of basaltic rock. You yeah, know? I was going to ask you so that so such so they're straining. Obviously, uh, the more stress, stress on a vine, it's crazy. The better it is for the wine. So uh, if you smell the wine, if you just tell, taste the wine, like that's all this sea breeze, seashell, like it's that saline quality then when we talk about like the weird word of minerality you know like this like now we can talk about what really minerality is because that's definitely what these vines like they're protected like think about like the coluras like in greece like where they have the baskets Mm -hmm. so they're protected by these basaltic uh wall stone walls they protect them from the winds again middle of the ocean and uh the in in salt just salt all over the place which salt easily can burn the whole fruit burn everything so it's very interesting that like it totally filled that salinity and then like this this um these soils are very rich in potassium which elevates the the saline uh, uh profile of the ones but super fresh of course it screams like for oysters and yeah limpets no, yep, and yep. all that super kind of super fresh oysters oh man that's what we need <laughs> o- garçon <laughs> oysters um so that was dope thank you for that um I did see something though. You're also um, you you, you uh, Georgian wines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell oh me. man, I love Georgian wines. And more than liking the wines, what I like it to the people. I love the people because, like, when you're like sitting sitting down with you know, like, with architects, with physicians, with doctors, with geologists, that that not necessarily winemakers, but they had. They start making wine because they went back to their roots. Right. Because their families were doing wine passing the time, but during the Soviet Union, like they had to go to war. Right. They had like they left their land, so like then like they went back. Like again, they've been making wine for eight thousand years. The Caucasus. Yeah, is it, it, it's it's some of the oldest. Yeah, they have traces of tartaric acid in the yeah. in the in the yeah. clay vessels, yeah. which indicates, but that can be still kind of a, uh, a discussion with. With China and everything, like if it was vinifera or not, right, like right, right. But I'm gonna be nice. I'm not gonna be say that it's only Georgia. I'm gonna say Caucasus. So Armenia, I'm with you guys. So, <laughs> but uh, but it was just amazing. Like you talking about like when we spoke about like what's your favorite sound? Like right. You being like in front of the Caucasus and you just hear like all these crazy animals. Like wh- what is that? Should I be afraid? Like I just heard this. Like and you just hear like the whole thing and you're talking with people when. You know, like they're starting converting like their winery like to all these stainless steel beautiful things, and of course they have the the cavaries like the diamphora stuck in the soil. That's the traditional way, but you still like Soviet Union concrete uh, steel tanks. You still like see the Soviet Union trucks like across the street, like on the next vineyard. So there's a lot of things and emotions that pl- come into play. And for me as a black dude, like you know, like I was getting autographs. Because wow. people never came across with someone with dreadlocks in a winery, so but in a very humble way. No, I know. What you, yeah, no, that's that's like kind of like yeah, I get it. I get it. Like and 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 then you speak Portuguese and probably <laughs> a couple other languages and shit, right? Like it's even more, you know. But so, it was uh, mind blowing that that experience for me. Or maybe I, they thought you were Lenny Kravitz. Let's be honest. <laughs> Let's be honest. Oh, man. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're like, Lenny Kravitz is, is in the winery. <laughs> oh, man. Like Yannick Noah, Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yannick Noah. Oh, exactly. man. It's, it's, it's been a joy. <laughs> no, let, let, let's not bring Bill, Millie Vanilli, but, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like... Um, yeah, but Georgian wines really helped me, like, to go back to the to the basics of yeah. winemaking and the people and, like, trying to understand how someone that is just an architect can see, like, we need to plant the vineyards. I plant the vineyards, the vineyards this way because as an architect, it makes sense. I'm planting over here because I'm a geologist and everything, but really, like, toned me down. This was, like, probably like 2015 or 16 when I went the first time with Lisa Granick, the master of wine, and she looked at me, Bruno, you need to go. You need to come with me like you're going next year, like you're going with me. So I did. And ever since I've been like that, like another two times, I love it. It just makes total sense for me. And I believe in latitude. It's just having uh, pork kebabs and grilling and being out the same way Italians do, same way Portuguese do. So that kind of latitude feel like it totally, like it's, I mean, it's my ballpark. I love it, man. I fucking love it. All right. So, um, I. <sighs> So let's talk about virtual wine tasting because you're a little <laughs> bit of a beast on on <laughs> Instagram you, and educator. Uh, Matt, I mean, like, you know, personally, I've had a hard time with it because I'm a cancer. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I really thrive. And thank you for coming to the studio, by the way. You know, I thrive on thank you. these type of conversations yeah. with people. And they can happen, yeah. but, like, obviously it's a different it's a different vibe, you know, and, and – and um, but you, I mean you like you're killing it. You're you're killing the game you, right, with that. And I mean even like yesterday, like was it yesterday or two days? Yesterday, you yeah. You have fucking BB Gratz. No, yeah, that it was, was last week. Yeah. That was last week. BB Gratz. <laughs> so BB Gratz is like the hottest winemaker in Italy right totally now. I mean yeah. he's just cranking out. I got mm. a bottle of Testamata, oh, and yeah. I actually have a bottle of the, the white too. Um, awesome. Yeah. Love um, it. But uh, I was like, damn, this motherfucker got BB Gratz on IG Live. <laughs> I'm like, so glad he's coming on the show. I was like, shit. Um, so the Colore, the Colore is even. Oh scary. my god. So so tell me what 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 spawned you or spurned what 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 was the impetus behind just just going hard at this. Um, again, like when, when this whole thing started, like I was at home, like, oh, what am I going to do? Like, and I got all this delicious Portuguese wine and Georgian <laughs> wine. And I mean, what am I going to do? I had School's to... closed. I ain't got to pick my son up at three no more. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I had to brainstorm. Well, by another drum set. Okay. But then, <laughs> but, but seriously, then you, you brainstormed, right? I had to brainstorm. I had to do something about it. And it was actually something that I wanted to do, like to get a little more deeper, like in the educational part of, of Instagram, which some some great minds already were doing over there. But yeah. I started doing it and came up to my mind that I think one should be for all. And if I have this passion that that's what like I was successful at Tocqueville, that I was doing like tasting menus for eight wines and it'd be incorporating like different wines and people would leave happy. That's all about it's all about like putting a smile on the face of people and the storytelling, like the whole experience that I wanted to do. So I tried to resemble that in terms of like um, on my wine talks and and whatever like I'm talking about, like a wine that I just decided to open or something that, oh, like, oh, why people talk about Vigna Tondonio? Like, what's about this? Like, blah, 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 blah. Let's talk about Vigna Tondonio. You know, like, why not? Like, you know, like, oh, Syrah, Syrah, Syrah. Like, I'm bringing you Syrah from Morocco, and we're going to talk about the Muslim laws. You, got a, you had the Moroccan Syrah? Because Andre was raving about that fucking Moroccan Syrah. That, it's beautiful, Syrah. I, I got it. I went, I found it, it's, and then it fucking sold out, man. Michael, and, and and it's, uh, who is it? It's, Michael, it's Michael Skernick. It's Alain Graillot. Yeah, it's yeah. Alain, Alain Graillot. It's yeah, Alain Graillot. Yeah, he yeah, yeah, was yeah. with his son, like, traveling in um, in the Moroccan coast, like, in his bike, and then he saw, like, the Thalvin... Uh, vineyards and it was like okay this is cool and then so Sirocco Syrah from Morocco but Sirocco the North African right. winds that totally affect like the, the Mediterranean regions people people I'd say that but people fucking forget like Morocco is like the, the Mediterranean is not just like the Greek exactly. islands it's and not, shit it's Lebanon and, and Lebanon Syria and the French Israel and the, that's why the French exactly so the French have a huge talk in this because uh, when you think about like northern Italy like they always source their grapes from from Sicily, Puglia, because they needed alcohol to, they to need, complement. Yeah, the, ripe, the ripeness, yeah. They needed mm -hmm. that. But that's in their country and like in basically like feudal systems and everything that happened in the country. But it comes down to France, it was a little different. It was colonies. Yeah. They were Muslim. Yeah. And they could produce like big alcohol in their, in their grapes. So yep. a lot of those grapes, off the record, 
Like they were being sent. No, I know. No, they, they were being people sent. Like, uh, there was a time where like 70% of the grapes and French wine were fucking coming from, from North, North Coast Af- Africa. Al- uh, Algeria, yeah. Tunisia, and Morocco. Yeah. So, of course, like they can have like fucking all these. French. <laughs> <laughs> um. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> Your secret's out. <laughs> Black wine guy. <laughs> Booyakasha. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um but uh so like I it was just something in me that I and honestly it was something that I was already doing, like while yeah. working. Like you as a song, you know, like y- a lot of people say like oh, I cannot face like the camera, like you know, it's hard. Like and I first started actually by doing video reviews nonstop. Mm-hmm. Six minutes, go for it. Like four o'clock in the morning, nobody, like you cannot hear like the neighbor you cannot hear like someone buzzing the door and anything like it was just me four o'clock in the morning i'm going to do this like three four takes and i started doing it but um it's just a lot of work so but uh I it is people 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 it's i know i know it's a lot of work because um you know i it is like this is this is a fucking production I'm doing right now. It's like a English lot of, English is not my mother tongue. Like and yeah, I'm but like, I mean, but come oh, on, you said you got the Yannick Noah thing. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> like like you definitely getting a lot of the ladies are giving you a lot oh, of come on. they're giving you a lot of slack on your English. <laughs> um, but um, so I I just decided like to uh, to go that route I and an shit. <laughs> I started I started writing and always loved writing all the bands that I was with. Mm-hmm. always like half of the lyrics of the band was always like kind of me mm-hmm. you know like like sometimes dark sometimes <laughs> like sometimes goofy sometimes right. like weird like i was always like behind some of the lyrics in the bands that i was and i always liked to write and this thing like totally again the positives of the pandemic as much as possible was that totally was a turn point for me like after almost 20 years in doing this 18 years but you know like you need to do something different like that's probably time like for you to finally you know like do something different like my kid is now 12 so like it's that stage that he needs me like back again like to be like yep. with him and everything so i decided yep. like okay i'm going to go back to writing do something different and that's what uh kick uh kick started in me and actually something that i've been looking for for the mw so which is very academic uh, was all about doing the MS, mm-hmm. and I started to think like, perhaps that's not necessarily what I want. And writing and doing all these things, and got back to me to the idea that I've been thinking in the past six years about pursuing the Master of Wine, and that's what I'm thinking right now. Oh, I love that. You know, I I <coughs> I, I think if I went. For if I went for any fucking <laughs> if I went for more <laughs> if I went for any it, w- it would be the MW track just because I <sighs> whatever chip on my shoulder it's just uh, you know if you're gonna do the shit do the shit right mm-hmm. like like fucking I'm, I'm more I joke but like mm. uh, once I get in some I get really eggheady and really geeky about it and I mm-hmm. can see I can see the allure of that and and I, I I that's that's dope I think you heard it I think you heard it here first <laughs> Bruno's thinking about getting his MW <laughs> I love it um. So, and I also love what you said, like you said, uh, you know, you like, I had to do it at four o'clock in the morning because it was quiet and, and, and I would, and I would just do take after take and, and I love how you were like, and it, people don't get like, I had this moment where I was like, holy shit, I have a fucking podcast. Like I've just put something out in the world. Like, but even just to do a video on Instagram, like you're, you, cause, mm-hmm. cause somebody's going to say some shit. Somebody's mm-hmm. going to comment, you know, you don't know how you're going to take it. You know, um, somebody be like, I can't, what the fuck, I can't understand what he's saying, you know, because mm-hmm. Americans are pretty lazy, I hate, <laughs> when, when, when they come with dealing with people from foreign countries, mm-hmm. like, I've seen, I'm like, just be with the person, look in their eyes, and you can understand what they're saying, don't mm-hmm. be like, ah, 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 you know, like, so, I, I big ups for that, man, that, that's what's dope, and, but, like, it's, it's really paying off, I mean, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think you're like, I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm really like, like, you're so like, people don't even know how dope you are. Like you've got a little following, but like, like people like your shit's like fucking super legit. I'm glad I got you on here before. Like you, you, you're blown up and like, you know, now, now, you know, I got you so early on. I'm like, no, I don't care if you're master one. I, 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 Bruno, <laughs> Bruno, come on, man. Come on. Come on, we had some, we had, we had that burrito no, no, line, man. you, you know? You're you, you not crazy about MJ, so I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, like, nah, you know. Nah, that, nay, yeah, nay, nay, Yeah, nay. he's <laughs> like, you know, yeah, if you were MJ, MJ, I mean, I get, I get that that's your name, but, you know. <laughs> I was just walking by, there's actually a store called MJ, right? And 
Yeah, no, I, I you know it's so funny. We we you we peeped that. Yeah, and actually on the other corner there's a, a it's called uh uh, Alma Bank, and my mother's name was Alma. I was like, oh, okay, I'm, re- I'm recording in the right place. Like, literally, yeah. Um, no, so I had to continue. Like, and honestly, like, everyone it's out there, like, you know, the camera can be scary. Like, being the validation can be scary. And even some bullying can be scary. Mm-hmm. And, but, um, you know, like, you know, it's the same way, like, when you're bartending, it's the same way when you go to that eight top, that, like, I like Chardonnay, but I, I hate Chablis. You know, like you have to, you know, like you have to read. And but, but a lot of them don't know that. <laughs> oh, no. Chardonnay. That's, that's oh, part no, of it. No, no. Well, what are you talking about? Right, right. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, I had people like, people like, oh, people like, people like uh, I want a white burgundy. I'm like, okay, all right, here you go. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, it's Chardonnay. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, well, all white burgundy Chardonnay. <laughs> I mean, unless it's Borgogna Agote, but like, so it's so funny. People like, yeah, I know. I, you know, I, I, I don't like this. I'm like, uh, I hate Sauvignon Blanc, but I love Sincere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, but you, I, hate, I love Cloudy Bay, but I hate Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, man. Like, uh, I just drank some Barbe- uh, Barbera Diablo. Like, I was just in the summer in California, and I came across those vineyards because they thought they were Santa Barbara. So, yeah. So <laughs> 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 You know, like, but but honestly, but a lot of times, like, let's let's be fair here. Like, a lot of times comes that to a... Uh, to that critique you being a someone of flood and yep. and people yep. don't take you serious and they actually yep. think that you're BSing them like no this is sincere this is Sauvignon Blanc are you sure yeah no and especially when you're would of they, color too would man they, would they ask that same question if yeah exactly when you listen I I, I or I, even I, if I didn't have the pin on my right jacket. you got and you got a fucking pin right like literally like so they would still like looking at me and like fact checking the pin <laughs> like zoom in zoom out is this really for true like so. They're yeah. like taking it off your bite and trying to make sure it's real <laughs> and it's not plastic. You, you didn't come in a box of Cracker Jacks. It's a journey. It is a journey. You know, I, I've had to I've had to beg people to let me s- help them sell wine to buy, buy wine from me. Like so mm-hmm. sad. I'm like, no, dude, I actually know about wine, bro. I'm like, you know, I'm and now again. I'm like, I just had like a Portuguese wine expert on my show, mm-hmm. bro. Like, what are, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, it is a journey. It it is. It's that second guessing. Whereas, you know. Um, Buffy could come up and she's a waitress and they'll just take her fucking advice. She's like, oh, I like the Chardonnay, the Kendall Jackson. Mm. It's delicious. It's like, okay, mm. we're going to do the Kendall Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I've been surprising a lot of people that uh, would say no to champagne just because they hate Chardonnay. You know, just because I would like, but really? You just like you just don't like champagne just because you know that's Chardonnay because you just learn right you just because uh, you, you read you, yeah I learned on learned on, Vin, on, on, Vin, on Vin, Vivino or something I like that I hate Vivino but anyway that's another you know thing. like <laughs> and that's the other part too like that's another like I think it has been a stage in Psalms right now in the past few years that you've been fact checked in front of them I can see your phone I know you're in Vivino like but I'm describing you. Don't I know? Don't, listen, dude. I work in a I work in a store, and people are like, I'm like, you gotta believe that crowdsourced app instead of instead of a person who's right here, who 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 is telling you about why, like like literally like like yeah. Well, someone said it's never done. But I'm like, well, that's because like you want to drink fucking Miami, mm-hmm. right? You know, and Miami is delicious. I had to try a bottle. It is delicious. Like people like it, but it's, it's like Coca Cola. It tastes good. Mm-hmm. They made it taste good. But like, it's don't honest. don't don't talk about Pinot Noir because let me tell you something. There's some Syrah in that shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let's we can bring that conversation to Bordeaux too. But uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I, well, you know they 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 just I mean not someone a couple of years ago. Um, I'm sure they were doing it before, but now they allow Tariga. They, they're allowing. So that's actually great. Like it's super fun uh, for me as Portuguese, of course. Like the Tariga Nacional being brought and the Alvarinho being brought to the to the white varietals because both of them are fighters. They can fight diseases. Mainly Alvarinho is a great fighter. And both of them age potential, uh, you know, like yields and everything. And I think it was a, a very smart move. We were still talking about very small percentages. Mm-hmm. But to see like such uh, a region like Bordeaux to do that, like I think it's it's uh, it's it's a good step. It's I think it's super cool like to see like Bordeaux is open to do that and well they have to but uh right. <laughs> but uh, I think it's cool that uh, they're doing that so but uh, yeah we as Portuguese we are excited to do, to to see that so let me ask you a question yeah. uh, well I'm going to ask you let me ask you a question I've asked you about yeah. fucking 50 um what was like what was like the killer bottle of wine oh boy. for you like that was like bam that's so funny there's a <laughs> 
I was, I was, we're in a studio and someone was holding up a bottle of Barefoot. I swear to God, <laughs> she just, she just held up. I was like, right when I said bottle of wine, and she held up like a Magnum of like Barefoot <laughs> Moscato. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my God, this is the best episode. No, but for instance, like we, we had these conversations about, we had this thing about the Moscato thing. Yeah. A few months ago, like the perception of Moscato and how. Which is, it's. I love Moscato. Exactly, and and actually, I, during that time, without not knowing what was going on, and before that, I spoke I spoke about about Zivivo, you know, like Moscato Alessandria in in Sicily, mm-hmm. which is still the same varietal, but basically, I tried to expose like how the varietal can be so diverse right. and has all these different ranges. How Moscat, it's so different. It can be perceived like in different ways, and that's just the perception how people can handle diversity and can handle like. Perception. It's just like I think Moscato was actually a great point during the pandemic towards wine. I think it was a great, a great feeling um, that how a lot of times the industry like sees like people in a certain way. They um, okay, let let me start like putting that uh, ice on the side for your Chardonnay, or let me start like making your Kiriyal and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. it's something that needed to be brought up. Mm-hmm. True, mm-hmm. but in the meantime, I think the industry and we as songs we should bring like. Let's talk about Muscat. Let's talk about like how diverse Muscat is. How Port, um, actually today is uh, International Port Day, and how diverse Port is. So that's a lot of things that uh, I think in times like this, like all these uh, tools that we have with social media and everything, I think it's great to have someone in Maine, someone in Alaska, that, oh, someone in Pennsylvania that cannot buy certain wines, they yep. can have like, oh, Okay, I cannot buy it. I cannot go to the store, but this guy is telling me this. MJ is telling me that. So, that's all about. Yeah. So, man, shit, you've had so many successes in this business, um, well deserved. Um, but was there ever a time when you were like, "This isn't for me. I need to go back to drumming." I don't know. I don't know if I, I should. I could do something else. Mm-hmm. So, was there ever a time when you like thought about walking away from the industry? Like, oh, many times, man, many times. <laughs> That's like how, like a lot of times, like some cool ideas came up to my mind and stuff that I wrote like five years ago, and now I'm going back and now I'm talking about that when I'm talking about that region, because it would be four o'clock in the morning. It's just like, damn, I just spent like twelve hours. I opened the rest and I closed the restaurant. You know, I have to do inventory tomorrow in the morning, and I haven't seen my kid. Like I don't have a life. Like I just want a beer and a decadent burger and play pool, and I can't. <laughs> you know, like I'm just go back to the render and do some karaoke <laughs> about it. But, you know, like, but in the meantime, you can't. And, like, you just, like, dude, like, um, you're, you're, like, people start, like, you know, having families and moving out and everything. So, yeah, a lot of times I felt, like, industry, like, uh, it's 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 very challenging. And I think right, mainly right now we have a chance in hospitality to think, like, what can we do to do better in terms of, uh, uh, of diversity, of... Uh, um, inclusion, um, all these issues that we know that industry needs to deal with, like how can we, we shouldn't be waiting for the pandemic to have tables outside in New York City, like how can we like always like thinking ahead of time, mm-hmm. you know, like all that, so there's a lot of things that needs to uh, to be done, and, um, but many times, yeah, uh, I thought about it, like, can I continue to do this? What can I do? What can I contribute? Like, what can I do? And that's how I'm seeing what I'm doing right now. It's like, how can I help my groceries, uh, my uh, retail store next, uh, next to me? How can I help my importers? How can I help everyone? Some that want to break in, you know, like, so that's my perspective towards hospitality right now. It's that more. Mm, mm, damn. Well, shit, that's a good place to stop. I mean, dude, you are... Uh Fucking you got a great heart. It's a really great heart. Um, incredible story. Uh, great work ethic. Uh, love your love for your son and how that's a driving force. I mean, you've said that so many times. Also love that fucking four o'clock in the morning. That's like when you, you get shit done. Like like that's like your witching hour, man. You know, like in the pa- you know, I take the path train because I live in New Jersey. Like a lot of ideas like came out of the train. Like a lot of ideas like just like I can like okay, I just missed a train. Only have a train like in thirty minutes. So I'm gonna walk. 10 blocks and just like think what I learned today like think like what I need to say to this person tomorrow and uh, and, and all those things and not try to bring that anger back home and not try to bring that uh, 
hype, sugar rush in the meantime, too. <laughs> a lot of those things that easily can happen at four o'clock in the morning after like a couple of Negronis on or, and stuff like that. So, um, and mainly even today, like, you know, and of course, like I'm always been like kind of a vampire, like yeah. a night howl. Like always got been that, you got that, uh, you know, black Portuguese <laughs> Lestat fucking thing going on. <laughs> And I have my peeps, like I have my peeps back in Portugal, they're waking up at nine, uh, eight, wait, nine o'clock, seven o'clock and like, hey, Bruno, you're awake? Like, uh, let's talk about this and this and that. Like, oh, dude, okay, it's four o'clock. Like, uh, I want to go to bed. Like, huh, but let's just talk about this and this and this. Okay. Which actually that helped me during the pandemic to have like, I'm have sure. your friends, like <clears throat> the friends that you grew up with, like back in your country telling you, hey, dude, you okay? And actually people over here that you work every day, that you know every day, they don't. It no, I, no. Anything. I know. And that's when, like, the friendship comes back to you. Like, you know, like that person that he spent like three, 30 years and stuff like that. This guy, that girl, like, they know, like, Bruno, I know you're far away, but how are you doing? So, but that really helped me. And a lot of times I was just at <laughs> waiting for that moment at four o'clock in the morning. I know, like, my peeps, even people in Georgia, like, hey, what's going on? You know, like, I made friends in Georgia, like, so. That's good things about that we can say about the pandemic, like that brought people together in a different way. And so, yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, thank you so much, Bruno. Mm -hmm. Bruno D. Almeida, um, tell people where they can find you and how they can be a part of what you're doing. So, I am basically like my my, my driving force is all in uh, in on Instagram at Romelier. And again, it's Romelier because the drummer Romelier and. Again, an idea at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> that happened at 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know how many Negronis were that night. But, <laughs> um, and that happened, just like um, trying to incorporate bo both worlds. I truly believe that, for instance, Bibi yeah. like he's he being like um, an artist, like he, he, I, I love when winemakers mainly like they have like an artistic drive into them. Yeah. That truly, that truly shows like in their wines and their yeah. perspective. Yeah. And for me, like, there's a lot of things. That's why, like, when I post, like, something like I just did today about ports and classic music with John Williams about, like, Star Wars and everything, mm -hmm. like, it just makes total sense. Like, how a port, like, builds up, how a Madeira builds up, um, well, how a champagne builds up, like a composition, momentum, drive, boom, 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 climax, chill, next. So, like, for me, like, for me as a musician, I could see myself, like, in a wine world. So that's... Um, my my take so yeah you guys can find me on uh, as a drum on um, on instagram that's my main thing awesome well damn bruno thank you so much and until the thank next you. time cheers to the mavericks philosophers deep thinkers and all the wine drinkers zim j black wine experience season two peace thank you cheers Soon. <laughs>